you have to learn that. And that's the big yeah. lie of democracy, uh, that we're all representatives of the system that represents us. And our job is to point the system at each other. Uh, that's like the big, to me, core lie of, you know, our modern democratic society. And I actually, a friend of mine gave me a book that was written in 1943, Psychology for the Fighting Man. It was actually written by and for the U.S. Army. And it lays a lot of this stuff out. It discusses propaganda. It discusses uh, race and different things. And it basically predicts everything that's going on here <laughs> right now with, with our society, how uh, you represent the system. Uh, you know, it was honest. It was honest about that. And uh, people think that somehow they're representing an abstract right, something that's that some fantasy about what's good and right. And they think they're representing that because they don't have any religion. You know, I mean, they don't have any faith that, look, if you stayed home, if you didn't go to church, you know, they tested your faith and it was found warning. OK, that happened. That happened this year. The reason why uh, the BLM thing exploded the way it did. And the way it's continuing, the way it did, is because during the shamdemic, Christians stayed home and they didn't go to church. And people of other religions stayed home and didn't go to their holy places. That's why this went down the way it did. Because they knew then that they could just use the news to tell you not to do what is supposed to be the most important thing in your life. And you only do for one hour a week. And that you'll do it. That you'll get a better than 95% compliance. They knew then that they could rule you with just the Oracle. So that TV in your living room, the computer, your smartphone, okay, your device of supplication, you know, that's like, uh, that's like an ancient Greek spending every day in the presence of the Pythia at the Oracle of the Shining God. It's going to blast your mind. You know, we're literally in contact. The normal American is literally in contact with our subconscious and subtextual definition of the divine in, in intimate contact with that eight, 10 hours a day. Okay. Particularly during this lockdown, I visited some very close friends and family who met me on their patios and they all gained weight. And when their faces were just like writ large and deep with terror, they, these people were haunted. They looked like on the verge of sanity. They couldn't hug me. They couldn't shake my hand. They had to show the babies to me, uh, you know, and they're literally trapped. You can see signs of sorrow on the outside where they're, they're allowed to go out in the yard, but the fear has got them. They're not even weeding. I, I feel this. They're, they're not even weeding. I, among my loved ones and among myself, like I am not afraid of the virus whatsoever. I don't care about it. I probably already had it. I will have it again. I don't care. Um, you know, but the 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 reality of like taking my daughter to the grocery store and having her break down in tears because everybody's wearing masks and waiting in line and just acting so creepy. The fact that playgrounds are still taped up with caution tape. No, they did open the beaches, so we have been able to go to the beaches and we've been visiting with certain family members and friends, but. It's absolutely oppressive. People need to know that right now they're, they have a new religion being installed in their minds because we basically all admitted that whatever religion we had, it wasn't worth catching a cold. Okay. Uh, so the if system. If you think about that, think salt, like empty my, altar. my grandmother who is dead, she would have delighted at the thought of being a martyr in a time of persecution, of going to church, catching a cold and dying while being persecuted for her faith. But, you know, she she was a person of real deep faith. And she would have thought that that would be grand, a great way to go out. <laughs> well, so the system has an instinct. I'm not saying it's any conscious conspiracy. All these things are reflections of plans have been worked out by outside consultants ahead of time for the systems of control. You know, where they talk to people like me, okay, or even ask me to write a story about this what if and get ideas out of the story. That's how you use fiction writers for projects like this, uh, for modeling it decades ahead of time. And uh, so I don't, I believe in Uncle, what Uncle Ted said, that 
the system develops an instinct and these things will happen. And the system had was hit with an overwhelming realization that it had no faith at any percentage level higher than 1%, which means that at least half of those people are yearning for a faith because they don't have it. And the other half of those people might be conflicted enough that they could be trusted enough to be heretics so that the people yearning for the faith, which are largely going to be found on the left in, in this iteration of this, in this reformation, uh, they're going to have somebody to persecute that they can coalesce around. So we are in a, I call it a, you know, we're not in a civil war. We're in a reconstruction, but it's more than that. We're in a religious, we're in a religious reformation because our de facto religion, which is money. Okay. Even that got crushed for this thing. Our de facto religion, the religion that we permitted to take away our other religions and have us go to work on Sunday. Okay. Uh, or Saturday, those, uh, even that capstone religion, that ultimate degeneration of Western faith, that was seen as having evaporated, which was true because people stayed home from church. Even the most fundamentalist Christians I know stayed home from church and their pastor agreed that it was a good thing to do. Uh, he was seduced by the Oracle of the Shining God and decided that it was OK to hold YouTube church. We are now in a reformation. I don't know who Martin Luther was. OK. Uh, I don't know who Calvin's going to be. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, I would suggest that a lot of the, there's going to be more warlocks burned than witches in, in this iteration of it because the system has, uh, the, the faith that was burning witches and during the Reformation, at least the faith that burned the most of them, they were very threatened by the feminine because you were talking about a bunch of gay dudes that were into torture and women who did practice term remedies. And they wanted to get the money for for saying prayers over you instead of, you know, the old lady at the edge of town treating you with her herbs. But now the system keepers are more jealous of the masculine, just like the priests, uh, the preachers and the ministers of the Reformation were very jealous of the feminine. And even the, the Puritans were still very jealous of the feminine. And they got even worse than the Catholics because they didn't even have Mother Mary to, to shine a light on this thing, right? They are, uh, now when I read about Cotton Mather speaking about what a good thing it was that this woman whose only crime was she said to the judge, my prayers are between God and I, and you don't have any business in them. They killed her for that. OK, and uh, so what, 1681. OK, whenever it was the Salem Witch Trials, they smashed her. They didn't burn her. They smashed her between these big planks like uh, a vice. Uh, that old woman, uh, that was extreme rage against the feminine. OK, so you got this polarity that flips around. So memories of that cultural memories of that persecution of the feminine has been reversed to do this persecution of the masculine. That was the system persecuting the feminine back there. That wasn't the masculine persecuting the feminine. That was the system persecuting the feminine. But that is now being used to get feminized men and feminine people of all 682 genders, whatever they are, to now persecute the masculine. So I think you're going to have more men uh, are going to be the persecuted witches now than... Uh, then you'll have women, but there'll be women out there, too. There's so much going on still and more every day. It just never quits. But one of the things that we should talk about, two things, I don't know if we'll have time. Um, one is that I, want to, I kind of want to show you some video of what happened when BLM was demonstrating outside of a church, partly because the video is kind of shocking and partly because I want you to talk about what church-going men need to be doing. You wrote a wonderful piece called Usher, which I've linked out many times. I've tweeted that out many times. Um, and you wrote it after like there was a synagogue shooting, but it's really an evergreen piece. Let me see if I can pull this video up for you here. Uh, the rise of our new religion. It's been in formation for a while, but it's the new altar created have risen abruptly. 
I believe, due to the fact that virtually all religious Americans decline to attend religious services based on media commands from governors. <laughs> yeah, I, so. I agree with you. Um, all right, here's the first one. So this is like the doorstep of the church. This is at Grace Baptist Church in New York. Oh, I really like these blonde uh, bean guys. Uh. Yeah, no kidding. The one, though, mm, can't find it. Well, I'll show you what happened. Really push inside. It's this one. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Oh. really upsetting because you know just let those guys walk in oh you can't uh you can't defend against certain people so uh, this is just you have to let them come in just like You'd have to let the Lord come in in medieval times. If he wanted to come into the church and drag a woman out of there that he thought was too pretty to be a nun, he could do it. I mean, he might end up going to hell, but he's going to give his way during the day. And his dad could give enough money to the, uh, to the bishop, uh, he might still get into heaven. But these, uh, Christianity didn't start with all of these huge church churches. Uh, they even had, uh, services in catacombs. Uh, you know, under under the city, so it might have to go back to that. But the uh, the function of Christianity as a support system for the U.S. government is now over. Hey, you know, I'm a mom wow. supremacist. Wow. So, as a as a mom supremacist, that's the kind of stuff that just really makes me mad because they let her walk in there by herself. <sighs> that guy with a vest on, that's a, some BLM dude, and yeah. just right up on the mom. There's not a protective instinct that's been being scrubbed out of American manhood for 50 or 60 years. I remember Officer Friendly coming uh, to school and telling us kids never to try to defend ourselves if we were attacked to just do what the person said. Yeah, you know, this goes way, way back. I'm pretty old now. I can still remember that from when I was seven or eight years old. And um, the whole idea of having women vote in 1920 was to be able to get scare them to death so they could feel like they were voting in their own personal bodyguards, the police who were going to protect them from their nasty husbands. This is where it ends up going. Now, I think with what happened during the COVID, uh, I, I didn't actually say that. I, I've never even written that. Okay. <laughs> but what, what happened with the, the shandemic with almost every Christian in this country staying home uh, when they were told to unconstitutionally, uh, and supposedly these people believe in the Constitution and the Bible and believe that, you know, the relationship with God is more important than the relationship with the governor, they all went against that. Now, the churches uh, have been very closely allied to the U.S. government for its entire history and were very closely allied in pre-U.S. provincial governments in Plantation America before the nation was founded. And they constitute part of the support system, the social support system for 
the nation state, I, even though Christians might outnumber people who feel passionate about left wing politics and, and, and racial politics, they're not willing to fight for that. Okay. And that was obvious. They, they weren't even willing to be disobedient for that. So if the, if the government is looking for a support system that's going to be aggressive on its behalf at some point, it needs to veer away from these churches and take this religious impulse that people have. Most people have a strong religious impulse to believe in something greater than them, even when they're atheists, and then they'll believe in the collective and uh, usher in the new religion. Okay, it's uh, it's a religion that's based on guilt. So it actually comes out of Christianity, just like atheism comes out of Christianity. It's not the only religion that comes out of. There's another religion that comes out of that I'm not free to comment on. Uh, but it's one of the two religions from which uh, atheism comes, uh, the main religion from which I, atheism I, comes. Knowing some um, Muslims in town, I think that there will be like an American faction of post-Islamic Muslims too. Oh, that, that makes sense because again, it's the same yeah. root as the other two religions. So yeah, uh, that, that makes sense. The religious impulse is still there and to really form a new powerful religion, you need heretics. You need martyrs and you need heretics. All you need is some stupid cops to provide you with some martyrs. And uh, for heretics, all you need is people that are going to try to stand up for the now obsolete order. Also, the fact that there's a lot more uh, there, there's a lot more militant people on the atheistic side, and they have a very strong religious impulse. They apparently have a stronger religious impulse than people that still adhere to traditional religions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're, they're literally worshiping a wrathful and jealous God that yeah. is in their living room. It's funny because I've just been, I've been writing this up at the suggestion of a friend and I've written some exactly things that you've just said <laughs> that this, like our religious impulse is just, uh, it's like resurrected, you know, after, obvious. yeah. After generations of like John Lennon, you know, Everybody singing that stupid song together it didn't work. My brother-in-law showed me some videos of these guilty ghost people numbering. Each video seemed to have about a hundred guilty ghosts, and five or ten bemused, angry, and solemn uh, people of ebony hue. Okay, who were actually. Some of the people seemed embarrassed. Some of the people were crying. Okay. Some of the people that were being worshiped were humbled by it. Some of them were delighted by it. Some of it were made cruel and demeaning by it. But there were ghost people kneeling before their new icons, their living, uh, biological icons for the new religion, which is racial guilt. And the beautiful thing about this is that once the guilty ghost has abased himself uh, before the ebon god, then uh, he can become a disciple of this new religion and go attack non-guilty ghosts, which are now the heretics. This, I mean, this is just a fantastic religion that I wish I had invented. Uh, my webmaster once asked me if I could invent a religion so that we could make some real money. Uh, you know, it's, and I was like, look, I'm not L. Ron Hubbard. I'm not that much of a hack. I just not, I'm not up to it. Uh, but this is, uh, the, the, the main thing you need for formation of a new religion is, uh, a morality vacuum. So just by, uh, changing the names of words, uh, consistently changing the names of words and doing so rapidly and, uh, reversing taking what was considered good and making it evil and taking what was evil and making it good, uh, this causes enough of a morality vacuum that you can install your own religion. Uh, Gene Wolfe uh, wrote a uh, series of uh, uh, novels on a futuristic religion that would feature uh, 
technology as oracles. Uh, basically, televisions installed uh, in religious facilities uh, where people would connect with the uh, gods who were people that were uh, apparently infotech people who had uploaded their consciousness into a mainframe and then they were in turn worshipped by the people that their memories ruled over uh, in this generation ship. And the, uh, the series of novels is, is titled, it's four novels, it's titled Litany of the Long Sun. They call it the Long Sun because it's this cylindrical generation ship with this like sun in the middle of this rotating uh, tube where these people lived as they went to the world of the short sun, which is going to be the new place that humanity was going to see. So it was a story about a generation ship with a, uh, a technologically based religion. And we have it. It's already here. The man just died what uh, six months ago, five months ago. It's already here. I am upset about the establishment of a new religion. I, I, and I think, like, for, you know, I, I think that's something um, worth. We are in year one of our Lord, of our Lord Floyd. <laughs> so <laughs> something like that is, is to me, a valid um, use of my time and being online and stuff. Now, the Catholic churches were the ones that were, so far, I know, of four Catholic churches that were defaced and vandalized. I think uh, uh, Mother Mary was beheaded uh, in one of them. It, it makes sense that Catholicism is being targeted first because there is a lot of symbology. They have more symbology than the other extant faiths. Uh, they tend to have a weaker identity. They're, the Catholic Church in the U.S. is essentially acting uh, as an NGO for refugee resettlement right now. The other thing is, is that other Christians don't even consider Catholics Christians uh, to a large degree. So it's a way for the uh, it's a way for the the new faith to start uh, picking people out so that. The cobbler won't do anything when the hat maker uh, gets dragged away and the carpenter won't do anything when the cobbler gets dragged away. And then eventually it'll just be the one guy getting dragged away. So I definitely think that's a that's a divide and conquer thing there. I'm assuming that the last ones left standing here are going to be the Mormons. <laughs> the deep state Mormons. Yeah, I think they'll be, I think, I think the Mormons will be the last one. Uh, the last one's actually still, uh, practicing, uh, openly. But, uh, I'd really suggest to my Christian friends that, uh, they go back to the catacombs. Well, I, I wrote it on Twitter. That I wrote, this is a Fed post, but this is ridiculous. You have to go back to church. Um, we, you know, the Supreme Court ruled that Nevada, was justified in closing churches while at the same time leaving casinos open. <laughs> it's, and it's just embarrassing. I mean, it's it's like, why are we even pretending to have a constitution, a Supreme Court? It, it, this whole thing is just such a sham. Well, you know? I, think, I think the Constitution is a sham. I thought the Articles of Confederation and Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights were also a sham, and the Magna Carta was a sham. That's just my opinion. And I think that was the institution of a new religion. I think it was deistic, uh, Mason, uh, Masonic. And uh, I'm not sure of the details, but the way religious uh, symbolism was used, and particularly uh, Jefferson's deep involvement with it, and his editorializing he did uh, with the New Testament to break it down into a secular document. And, and the fact that it was obviously the hostile takeover of uh, resource extraction locations to develop manufacturing stuff on site uh, by the overseers. Uh, I really think that that was the institution of the worship of, of plenty, not just money. Okay. But the worship of economy and, uh, and abundance. 
mm-hmm. as an actual earthly religion. And I, it, it obviously came pretty seamlessly out of Protestant Christianity. And it's not a surprise to me that now that religion of capitalism uh, is being superseded by this guilt base, which is that's that's very Catholic there, but this uh, this guilt base uh, socialism. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know, so we go from you know the worship of avarice to the worship of of guilt. I, I just uh, well, so we now have this church of the act of contrition uh, for real and imagined crimes committed by other people in another age. So. It doesn't have to make sense, you know, obviously, because it doesn't make sense. There's no, the actual, the facts show that. That's the acid test for religion. Right. Is that it's irrational. Um, But people have that yearning. And it's, it's interesting because there's no, it's a materialist religion. You know, I'm trying to write something up about this that makes sense. But it's like, what you pointed out is that we worship our own bodies and our own comfort in America, besides worshiping money and commerce, um, we, it's like this, uh, fear of death and fear of illness and fear of discomfort. No, it's, a, you've, you've called it anti-heroic because, you know, a hero sacrifices his body by definition, you know, he goes into the battle not right. to, to survive it. One manner in which I think it's collectively self-worshipping is, and and this is really where our science-based uh, atheism comes in, which grew directly out of the Age of Enlightenment, which yeah. grew out of uh, the Reformation, and it negated the Renaissance. The Renaissance was a way to bring uh, to bring culture and physicality back together again. The old idea of the Renaissance man that was distinguished with the Enlightenment and then the affectation of all these effeminate things. The, the founders of modern Western culture, these faggots all powdered their noses and wore powdered wigs. Okay, I mean, this was a very effeminate culture. When you look at the signing of the treaty at the end of Pontiac's Rebellion and you look at these mixed-race Indians, uh, and a lot of them weren't even mixed race. They were straight up Caucasians, uh, in this, uh, open, uh, shed, uh, across from the set, from the men who penned and signed it on the English side. They look racially very similar, but the very effeminate artist depicted the, uh, the Englishmen as extremely effeminate and the people that they had defeated as hyper masculine. These guys look like the bad guys in the road warrior. All right. <laughs> okay. So th- this is, uh, th- this makes a lot of a sense. We, we end up worshiping the human mind and the, the, uh, the best way to depict atheism as a religion and as a religion, uh, particularly in its Western form is the, the fact that uh, atheists and I, Stefan Molyneux uh, did two uh, audio books on this. And he was very, he probably did the best attacks that I've listened to or read on it, on religion as something that's evil. And I don't believe, I don't believe that religion is something evil, but he's specifically going after Christianity as the model for world religions and why religions deserve to disappear. And, he is also at the same time explaining why atheism is a religion and he doesn't know. It. <laughs> so he, he and other atheists point out that religion is irrational because you believe in something that you cannot prove. Religion is uh, faith in something that you cannot prove. But atheism is the denial of something that you cannot disprove. Mm. So the atheistic mind says, if I cannot prove it, if I cannot frame it in my mind and rationalize it, it cannot exist. That is the dream of a God right Mm -hmm. there. That's Mm -hmm. what it is. That is man trying to frame himself as God. Mm -hmm. That's what atheism is. So we've come to the logical conclusion of a couple hundred years of atheism. Jason Reza Giorgiani does an excellent example 
of describing the religious fanaticism of atheism uh, during the French Revolution, mm-hmm. and even why they gave up on it and went back to in a, a hollow Catholicism, because they found that this rabid atheism actually ate the practitioners at such a high rate that they were losing cohesion, and then somebody like Napoleon comes along and reintroduces a, a type of military tradition. So uh, atheism is, an, is itself a religion. What the BLM movement adds to it is it gives you the guilt of a Catholicism. It, yeah, and that's, it, very, that's very important. It gives you this, this like Catholic level of guilt that you can put into your atheism. Big and it gives you sacrifice. It gives, it gives you, you sacrifice. Um, yeah, that's on my list. <laughs> so it gets away from the, because um, American Christianity, yeah, the American Christianity, Christianity has uh, been bereft largely of ritual. You yeah, know, Protestant yeah. American Christianity lacks a lot of ritual. Right. Like Catholicism uh, and the Orthodox Church had. And it depended and still largely depends on a prosperity gospel. Prosperity is quickly going away. Uh, we pretty much burned through the 70 million person bone pile of World War II. And now things are starting to level out. And uh, that prosperity is going away, too. So you need to get back to something that's got uh, more, sacri- uh, more sacrifice by somebody else rather than you and uh, more guilt. Yeah, it, it has guilt. It builds c- group cohesion. I mean, these people are going and getting together every night. The mask, the mask is a very, is a very cultic aspect mm-hmm. of this whole thing. The, the, the mask, the mask is essentially medically useless. I had an interesting conversation with my doctor about this. And D- David, David not. he said, look, you know, I built my own house. So I used surgical masks when I was sanding drywall. And he said, I'm, I'm inhaling particles that are 10 microns, which is like uh, a micron, a 10 micron uh, dust particle compared to a virus. It's like comparing the Titanic, you know, to a canoe. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he's like, yeah, it helps if five of us are leaning down over you while we're cutting open your body. It helps keep all of our, our germs from draining into you. All right. Okay. He said, but and- it doesn't do what people think it does. I mean, atheism is is really oppressive because in an anti-religious way, like C.S. Lewis, you mentioned earlier, you know, those Narnia books are wonderful because he was a devout Catholic and he wrote those books to awaken and cultivate the imagination and the mystery, you know, and we have these neighbors, our next door neighbors are Muslims, but they're really like kind of post-Muslim um, American materialists in a lot of ways. And so the boys, they do like the science stuff, you know, the dad just tells them all about outer space and stars and, and get them a copy and, of Gaddafi's uh, science fiction. I, I, I've never heard of that. I didn't know. If that <laughs> wrote. But I mean, it's, it's very tiresome because I actually know some physics and, you know, I'm, I'm, versed in in basic science and these kids are so like science oriented that they sit there and give lectures that I have to go and correct because they're actually wrong you know about stuff and I can't really let it slide but it's so boring and pedantic and I feel bad for them you know meanwhile my kids like have listened to The Hobbit dozens of times and all the Narnia books and um Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales and other other books old and old and less old you know children's books but they're fantasy books I don't like to bring up kids with this reverence for science that uh, it, to me it's inappropriate it's like what's the foundation of the false god yeah uh, another uh, thing that you might be able to use the Aztecs I believe it was every 51 years. They believed that uh, if there weren't enough sacrifices made to the gods, that the sun would not be relit. Something mm-hmm. like that. If the sun wouldn't come up again, it would be the end. There was a vast amount of fear and terror 
built into that religion. It was actually a very effective religion for the development of the state empire. And the God of the Old Testament was a wrathful and jealous God. And uh, particularly if you read the book of Job, and if you read the works of Increase and Cotton Mather from Plantation America from the foundation era of this country in the 1600s, Satan was a very important aspect to the dualism of Christianity. The idea that uh, Satan is actually, he might think he's against God, but he's working for God by testing man. And that's present in Catholicism as well, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 This is uh, uh, this is really I really recommend reading the book of Job. It, uh, I hadn't read it since I was in my early 30s. And it was a real eye opener after reading all, all the Plantation America rants about the Indians being the children of the, de- of the devil and the New Englanders getting what they deserved when the Indians rose up against them. And this is from the point of view of the pastors of the New Englanders who were assaulted by the Indians. Right. Uh, and so that makes a lot more sense after you uh, after read the book. So, <laughs> so the, uh, this idea that you have to have a devil has been lost by a lot of mainstream Christian denominations in this country. And these, these people, their denominations have lost potency and they've lost membership. And the idea that God is all about prosperity and helping you out, that's also in a lot of mainstream denominations, and you have people that want to hold on to their flocks trying to accentuate the positive in God's relationship with man, you're losing the terror that really puts the fervor in religious fanaticism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with the whole mythology of the Caucasian serial killer and of pale privilege and of the martyrdom of an entire race of people on the altar of another of another race's privilege you you start to get back to some really fundamental uh building blocks necessary for high levels of fanaticism so i I think this is definitely looking at a second reformation here and the christianity hasn't been scrubbed from it it's been highly corrupted uh, and hijack tragically, but it's uh, there's still recognizable uh, Christian uh, aspects to the new religion. It's rising before our eyes. It's it's rising like a a golem of a god that's being collectively built by us all, yeah, you know, with its different uh, beautific and, and horrific aspects to it. So I, uh, it's pretty exciting. I have seen uh, BLM slogans that say that white people should be grateful that we just want justice and we don't want revenge. You know, talk <laughs> about a terrorizing slogan. <laughs> well, I hope to get the revenge, too. That's the, that's the only thing that's going to wake most of these guilty ghosts up and these uh, slaves to sloth uh, that populate this country. Uh, until everybody's had a neighbor that's been dragged out of their house uh, by one of these uh, very pale and privileged <laughs> BLM mobs. Yeah. Uh, until that's happened, uh, I don't think there's any chance that enough people are going to wake up that b- before we're essentially in, we're already a Philip K. Dick novel, but <laughs> before, we're, before we're in Gene Wolfe's generation ship, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this is good because this is a chance. This was, you know, uh, Uncle Ted wrote about this, that the system will develop its own hunger and instinct Mm -hmm. and it will push against resistance until it breaks it. And then it will keep pushing harder because it's essentially a thing that has built up momentum. Yeah. And it's just going to keep going harder until it crashes. What it knows how to do. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. it's a it's a cancer. Yeah. This is a macro parasitic cancer. The system that we live under and which eats us uh, physically and spiritually. Uh, so it has gone into overdrive, I think, because a weird haired 
<laughs> orange meat puppet that tried to cut its puppet strings and got caught in its throat. And it's trying to regurgitate him and throw him up and mm. doesn't know how to digest him and pass him through. I think that's why this is actually happening earlier than it would have naturally happened. Mm. That, and with more you know, violence. Right, but it's it's earlier. And the earlier it happens, the better because the more of a chance people have to wake up before they're too old to do anything because the uh, most of the people that have a chance of understanding that there's something wrong, they're older than 30. Mm -hmm. You don't want to wait till they're 60. Yeah. And so the only people that can see what's going on are too old to do anything to save somebody around them from the blooming insanity that's going to engulf them. And I'm not talking about pre preserving an old political form or an old religion or anything. I'm just talking about preserving the sanity and perspective of individuals. Just enough people to be able to do that so that there'll be a, you know, so that there'll at least be a seed of knowledge that, you know, there was once a world in which everybody was not terrified and kneeling and obeying all the time. Mm. That's all. That, that's all I'm talking about. There's a better chance that that idea can be like the, the idea of the hero, which died. The idea of the hero has been largely dead in mainstream Western culture for a couple hundred years. Mm. And it's been intentionally, it had been intentionally purged from the culture. And, uh, but that stayed alive for the idea of some type of spiritual autonomy for that to stay alive. In an age of witch finding, in which the witch is always going to be sought out by the mob, by the hysterical mob, uh, that has a better chance of that idea of a pre-witch finder, you know, autonomous mind. That idea of that, the character in 1984, that does not break. The idea that there could be somebody that doesn't break. For that to survive, we're in a better position now. When you have people who are still vigorous enough to try to help bring a new person along that hasn't been indoctrinated yet, because the people between puberty and 40, I mean, almost all of them are just completely brainwashed. They're done. They ha will never have any capacity to see reality. The war on reality has been won. <sighs> and I read recently an old article by Greg Johnson who's a nice guy who paid me for a couple of articles and who totally rejected the idea of plantation America <laughs> as not conducive to building a large scale uh, racial identity uh, political movement in this country. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> he, he, after, after denying to me that the truth was worth anything because it wouldn't help build a large scale He's political a movement. Right. He wrote an article uh, on the rules for writers. It was like a two part article. It was a pretty good article, except for his insistence that a writer could never successfully complete anything with noisy distractions around. When I've written books on like Baltimore City busts, okay, and I wrote my first couple books when I was learning how to do it in the living room while my wife was watching stupid game shows, okay, and, and trying to distract me by throwing stuff at him. So, uh, aside from that, he points out that our job as people who are trying to enlighten other minds and preserve Western culture, which he pretty much, which he has really endangered by pursuing unachievable political solutions because he doesn't understand how power works. The, uh, in the end, his last paragraph, I was laughing out loud. I was reading an old print copy that was given to me by a friend of mine who was asking me for writing advice. And he wanted to know what I thought about Craig's writing advice. I said, well, I don't think he knew it, but in this book, in this, in this, like, not a book, it was a 3,600 word essay in two parts. In this essay, six years ago, he proclaimed the doom of what he was trying to achieve when he declared at the end of it that the lie has no powerful and that the truth is all powerful and all you have to do is keep speaking the truth and the lie will vanish like mist. No. The lie exists because it is a thing of power. It is a mechanism of power that has been sculpted by geniuses across many ages to conceal the truth from idiots. Okay. It was a hamburger that was designed by the greatest chef in the world to feed the hunger of the 
of the, the biggest obese idiot glutton in the world. Okay. That's what kind of creation it is. If we can use, you know, a McDonald's metaphor since they're doing so good in this, in this, uh, <laughs> shamdemic environment, uh, that's what the lie is powerful. The, the lie is hugely powerful. The father of lies, Satan, the devil, he resides in the earthly realm because he can impose God's will on man and teach man through the hard road of sin. This atheistic bone smoker who used to make fun of Southern nationalist Christians who would write him checks for thousands of dollars. Him and Richard Spencer used to laugh at these Christians who some of them are soldiers, some of them are law officers or upstanding guys. They financed this whole movement that was run by uh, by these uh, weird cultural fetishists. OK, the atheists that ran the movement, Craig and, and Spencer, would laugh at the Christians who funded it. OK, and then still say that the truth is more powerful than the lie. When, you know, they're children of the lie and they're uh, they're being financed, OK, by the sons of the truth and making fun of them at the same time. And they're running the show. OK, and, and they can't even see what they're doing. You know, so uh, so religion has been a huge part of this because man tries to uh, to reform his spirit into uh, a faithful construct so that he can share it with his fellows. And despite all the cruelties of time and fate, I think I think this is for the better, because if this uh, man had not been accidentally elected, uh, and the machine hadn't choked on him and had to sped up and rev its engine to try to grind him up in his gears, <laughs> then nobody would have woke up. I mean, there would have been a couple weirdo science fiction writers like myself. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. You know, so this is, I think it's a good thing. 